So this, the session on this stage is about strengthening the social safety net with civic tech. Um, this is something that I'm really excited to be moderating this panel because, you know, we all come to civic tech and digital governments from different, like for different reasons and from different backgrounds. Um, and for me, my, my background's in urban planning with a, with a focus on social planning and policy. And the reason that I care about this work is, is, is this, right? Like I, I'm not coming in from a technologist background. I'm not coming in as a designer. I'm coming in as someone who cares about um, who cares about this this question and how we can use technology and design um, to 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 do exactly this. So I'm really excited to be here for this session. I'm really excited to hear um, what our what our speakers have to say and have to share with us. Um, uh, and I hope I hope you are too. I imagine that you are, and that's why you're in this room. So so that's great. Um, so the way that this is going to work is we have four panelists today. Three are here in person. One, unfortunately, because of uh, who's coming in from New York because of uh, lots of travel changes that have happened over the past week, sent a video. So um, we have uh, three three speakers here in person. One that we'll be sharing a video from. Um, you'll hear from each for about ten minutes, um, and then uh, uh, ho hopefully we have time at the end to to answer a few questions as well. Um, so I will. Um, introduce them each before they before they're sort of like ten minutes, and then and then as we have time um, at the end, we'll bring all, all of them up to, to sit together and answer answer some questions. Um, so um, without without uh, yeah, I've already said without further ado today, so I feel like I shouldn't say it again. I need to, I need another transition uh, transition word. I'll I'll come up with that for this afternoon. Um, I promise. Um, uh, so, so first up, I want to I want to welcome Sandy McKinnon, whose pronouns are she and her. Um, Sandy is the executive director of Social Innovation Fredericton, um, and with whom I spoke excitedly about um, restaurants in Fredericton this morning. So, uh, additional plug in addition to all the wonderful things she's about, about to share with you. Um, Sandy has worked with nonprofit organizations in Fredericton for over twenty years. Um, she's, as I said, the executive director of the Greater Fredericton Social Innovation, where she has developed. Uh, and managed over 20 projects in collaboration with nonprofits and government. Um, and Greater Fredericton Social Innovation is also the birthplace of Civic Tech Fredericton, which you may have heard a lot uh, about of, uh, fr from. Um, uh, you know, on, if you're not from Fredericton, social, social media, online, things like that. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to, to welcome Sandy to the stage. Please join me in welcoming her. Besides talking about my kid and the raptors, talking about civic tech is my favorite thing to do. So I, d I did bring some notes because I get nervous and I want to make sure that I get all the information I promised the civic tech team that I would get out. So I think there we are. So that's me with some of our civic tech team after we won a hackathon. Um, Greater Fredericton Social Innovation is my employer and civic tech is one of the projects that we work on. And uh, we are a registered charity and we work with many of our nonprofits in our city, uh, specifically those in our caring sector. So Civic Tech, we meet every single Tuesday night. We started in November of 2017, thanks to Nick Scott inviting me to a session that uh, Gabe was in town talking about, uh, Civic Techs and Code for Canada. So a team of us got together and we've been rolling ever since. Uh, we started off with about five members, but now we're averaging about 30 every week. Um, we meet every Tuesday night in the same place, which is different from other civic techs across the country. We, we meet in the Nonprofit Resource Center, of which um, I am the host, which really just means I mop the floor on Sundays. And um, the Windsor Foundation helps us pay the rent in our space. So we do a lot of work uh, for our government, but the majority of the work we do is for our nonprofit sector. So there's an, some examples of some of the organizations in our caring community that we work with. Um, for example, Meals on Wheels. In Fredericton, 365 days a year, they deliver 200 meals. They have 20 drivers and three depots. And so they asked, could Civic Tech help them uh, route their drivers? And one of our Civic Tech volunteers from day one, his name is Pierre Cormier, he's the school bus router for the province. So this was light work for him. Um, 
We are currently working on a uh, meal planning tool for our Greener Village Food Bank. They develop healthy meals and the team's working on connecting the ingredients in the meals to a grocery store database so they could ballpark the cost uh, per meal and budget for the month. We're also looking at food centers across Canada. There is no meal planning tool available to them. Um, and sometimes we just do little things like Community Food Smart. If you ever have an opportunity, get on YouTube and search Community Food Smart. It's a monthly program where we do, uh, bag about 400 bags of groceries. Uh, it's a sustained uh, uh, pro project and we deliver them to uh, community organizations who order in advance. We buy directly off the truck. We buy as much local as possible. It's been going on for five years and spreading right across our province. So my colleague who works on this project was really mucking up her very complex Excel, Excel spreadsheet. So all she did was come in and just ask for some help on an Excel spreadsheet. So that'll give you an idea of some of the diverse projects that we work on. I'm gonna talk just quickly about some data visualization we've done. So the first one, um, we entered a data visualization competition based on the United Nations um, sustainability goals and we looked at no poverty. What would it cost for our province to bring every household up to the poverty level? We worked out to $302 million a year. So Civic Tech likes to do projects like this. Um, the one in the middle is the hub. That was part of the Smart Cities um, pro, uh, competition, and of which Fredericton was a finalist. And this project is moving forward with uh, support from local organizations. So it's basically our city is hosting a cause-based hub, so you can land on and find out whatever cause, if you care about food security or poverty reduction or transit and the environment. And behind these cause-based hubs, are, uh, is where data and, uh, and uh, other open data sources are available. They're gonna partner with Civic Tech. Civic Tech representatives are adopting a cause and going to do analysis for our nonprofit sector. One of the big things I think it's really important is um, data consistency, that we're collecting data and we're not having to scrub it. Like even consistency in intake data all of our shelters in the Fredericton area use HIFAS-4 system, and so a team at Civic Tech looked at HIFAS-4 census data and a lot of the other open data sets that are available uh, for analysis and have come up with um, data standards. So we're working with our funding bodies like the United Way and the Community Foundation for them to implement these data standards that will encourage our nonprofit sector to do the same. As you know, we are very under-resourced, got our heads down, we're busy feeding people and housing people, we don't always have time to do data analysis. So this is really a game changer for our nonprofit sector. And the other one I wanna talk about is we looked at the role that um, our transit system plays in social isolation of older adults in our community. And our school bus driver, router Pierre Cormier and another guy, Kyle Rogers, uh, led this getting seniors there. They looked at um, all of our bus stops and and the routes of our buses, and they graded the bus stops based on if, how accessible they were. So if your bus stop had just a pole and a snowbank, you had a low grade, but if you had a, a shelter with a bench and a slope sidewalk and what have you, you got a higher grade. Then they uh, did projection data into 2028 and identified a 10-year plan for our municipality to upgrade those bus stops over the next 10 years. So that's a pretty cool one, and we won $1,500 for that, so that's what's paying for pizza right now. And, <laughs> and so, um, which is kind of interesting because our data, data people, you know, they're walking around the developers going, you know, we're the breadwinners now. So it's quite fun. But today I'm gonna quickly talk about um, a project called the Caring Calendar. So I was on the Mayor's Task Force on Homelessness and I chaired the Partnership Committee and during that time we brought together 70 people from 42 different faith-based groups in our city. This includes our one mosque and one synagogue and um, these are the folks there. We mapped out all the services they provide to people in the circumstance of poverty in our city and it's colossal the amount of work our faith-based groups do. Everything, laundry, showers, taxes, GED training, meals, accommodations, it's crazy. And every single one of them when they reported back said, we can do more. You know, we have a congregation want to do more. But what we realized on this day was sometimes they were doing the same things in the same area on the same day, but they're different denominations and they had no way to co coordinate their, 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 their um, services. So I want you to remember these folks 
are representatives of the church. They're ministers, pastors, the iman, you know, that type of thing, So, because I'm going to come back to that. So Civic Tech decided to take on the creation of the Caring Calendar. We started work on it, and uh, we reached out to all the attendees with some questionnaires, and almost every single one of them referred back to their admin staff. You'd need to talk to admin staff. So we learned a very valuable lesson there because we were at first going to be developing for those other folks that attended the event, but they're not the frontline workers, they're not the admin staff, they're not gonna be the ones that are going to be updating the caring calendar. Which for us was great, we were grateful because they were way more tech savvy than, <laughs> you know, than, uh, than some of the leaders in the, in the faith-based groups. So we've gone through a number of design thinking and, and uh, launched caring calendar in beta and uh, that's the launch over there in March. We had about 45 people in our nonprofit resource center for the launch in beta. We had five churches that took it on um, for, for a couple of months and got the, we received all the feedback and now all those updates have been done and it's ready to go. So here I wanna mention a couple of things that are really important. Our city of Fredericton hosts all of our licenses. We develop using AWS. Um, I work with students quite a bit. If you have a university in your area and they have a social work program, this is a great place to tap in. These are examples of social work do students doing their social action pla placements. I've had 12 every year for the past three years and I expect to get six more starting next month to help with full implementation of Caring Calendar. We also have two first year pro bono law students from UNB that are coming to Civic Tech every week to uh, learn and answer questions and help us and do some research on intellectual property and, and, and some protections. We had, um, we had somebody pitch us a project a couple of weeks ago mapping out defibrillators and there was some concern about the role Civic Tech would play if somebody went to a building where there was a defibrillator and the building was locked or the defibrillator battery was not uh, uh, kept up. So anyway, we're still working on that. Um, that's Dan and Howard Powell at the bottom over there. They, are, uh, they were the leads on the first launch. Now we have two, two new leads uh, that just finished. So in this picture, I wanna show how easy it is because you know, to quote um, Stuart McLean, we're not big, but we're small in Fredericton because we, uh, there's our mayor. He drops by all the time. The head of innovation for our city of Fredericton and the open data portal guy are regular attendees. That's our MLA, Stephen Horseman. Our MP, Green Party candidate, uh, Jenica Atwin, her office is right across the hall from ours, so she's in all the time. So they're, we're really engaged with our municipality, so he was the past, he was the past um, Minister of Social Development, and there's Momo teaching him exactly what, uh, what happens with the no poverty data visualization. These two guys are from Russia. We're in the middle of a, a, an election coming up and they offered to help a mayor with the election, which is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> and over there, the city of Fredericton honored us. <laughs> they did, it was funny. And so over, over in the far picture, just before Christmas, we received uh, an intercultural award from our city of Fredericton. Um, more than half of our, our volunteers at Civic Tech are new Canadians and they've really found community and engagement and jobs and help with resumes. Everything from, you know, how to walk on the ice to I need a new pair of boots and what school should I send my kids to. Um, we have a potluck every quarter where they bring foods from their con different countries. Um, we've had the Brazilians and the Egyptians chirping on who's the better barbecue. So this summer we had the big barbecue. I called it a tie. Um, but I just want to say that Civic Tech Fredericton, we are a family, and I'm the mom, and uh, and and uh, I love it. It's uh, it's a, so if you're in Fredericton, uh, please come by. I'm born in Toronto, raised in Montreal, but when I'm in Fredericton, I always say I got here as soon as I could, and so please try to make your uh, visits to the East Coast on a Tuesday night, so you could come, <laughs> so you could come and meet our amazing team. That's it for me. That was like bang on time, so like really, no, no, no pressure. Thank you. <laughs> um, up next, I want to in, uh, introduce Elvis Wong, whose pronouns are he and him. Elvis is the managing director of Innovate Financial Health, 
um, which is a nonprofit startup accelerator for solutions improving the financial lives of Canadian, uh, Canadians, plural. Uh, previously, Elvis has worked with social capital partners to tackle wealth inequality and future of work in management consulting at Kearney. And he was one of 25 young systems leaders from across Canada selected for the y, uh, Mars Studio Y Fellowship Program. Uh, and and uh, Elvis graduated from Queen's University with a BCom. So please join me in welcoming Elvis to the stage. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so as Leah mentioned, I'm Elvis. Uh, I'm the founder and managing director of Innovate Financial Health. One sec. Cool. Uh, so Innovate Financial Health. So what we are is we're a startup accelerator uh, specifically for solutions improving the financial lives of Canadians. Um, so I know that for Code, of Can for Code for Canada, a lot of this conference is around how do we integrate tech into nonprofits, into government. Uh, I'm taking this from kind of a different standpoint. It's how do I get the tech ecosystem to be more focused on solving social challenges? So that's kind of my side to this, um, to this conversation. Uh, and our goal, uh, five-year vision, is just to uh, support 50 different innovators, uh, reach a million Canadians, and help these Canadians save uh, over $100 million uh, through the products and services that we help scale uh, through our accelerator program. So I'm not sure if anyone, uh, if everyone knows what an accelerator here is uh, today. Um, so for uh, just an example, we just launched our first accelerator in January of 2020, and we selected four startups to be part of the program. Uh, and what we do is we provide them with grant funding, so $25,000 each, uh, three months. We have workshops that are focused on value proposition, user design. Uh, we have uh, Code for Canada actually come in and teach inclusive user testing uh, to our different startups. Uh, and then we also have 80 plus mentors uh, and advisors from financial institutions, uh, venture capital firms, uh, nonprofits, et cetera. And the four startups that we have selected here today, uh, there's altruism. Uh, they're focused on how do you deal with financial life events? So graduating, um, going through a divorce, uh, death of a family member, uh, what's the different tools and what's the education you need when you go through those events? Uh, Policy Me, it's, what they do is help access life insurance um, and increase the access uh, to more people. Uh, Cuber is a savings platform primarily for middle income women from uh, Halifax actually. And then Zezun out in Calgary is helping uh, employees access affordable credit uh, so that they don't have to go to a payday lender, for example. Um, so. Just one specific example of something that we've done. Uh, we matched uh, Cuber with an organization out in Calgary called Momentum. Um, so Momentum is a local nonprofit there. They're a financial empowerment organization. And they run a match savings program every year. And in 2018, for example, they helped low-income Calgarians um, access more than $300,000 uh, in match savings. So, uh, Momentum, one of our partners, they've been wondering how do we 5x our impact and how do we actually get uh, more Calgarians um, to build $500 emergency funds. So we partnered Momentum with Cuber and uh, now they're actually in the middle of a pilot where if you save, if you're low income in Calgary and you save $110 on the Cuber platform, uh, Momentum will give you 40 extra dollars. So it's helping people build that habit to create emergency funds. Um, but this is just the first steps, right? So this is just a pilot. The goal is to expand this all throughout Calgary, but also nationally. So um, there's match savings programs all across the country. Um, there's some here in Canada and Toronto with Wood Green, uh, West Neighborhood House, different organizations here. Uh, and then also employers are interested in match savings as well. So they're in partnerships with all of these organizations, with Levi's, with Sun Life, kind of through this program. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get these tech companies and having them um, serve nonprofits and then also just serve Canadians in general. So, how do we get uh, started for Innovate Financial Health? So, today I just want to tell you a little bit about our story and how we got started. And it's actually funny. So, uh, I was actually part of a fellowship in two years ago, three years ago now. Uh, so, similar to the Code for Canada fellows, um, about two to three years ago, I was doing a systems leadership fellowship. Uh, which Rowan actually talked a lot about systems change. That's what the purpose of this fellowship was. 
Um, so as part of that, it was a nine month program and they gave me a research question. How might we use innovation to improve financial inclusion in Canada? Um, so we spent, uh, our team, we spent about nine months just trying to understand the program, uh, problem here in Canada, right? So we were thinking, we were kind of volunteering, we were talking to different fintechs, we were talking to nonprofits, we were talking to financial institutions, and we were just trying to figure out who's doing what here in Canada um, and what's the gap that's necessary. Um, so we learned a lot throughout the process, uh, but there are three kind of key insights that we had uh, that we thought were pretty relevant. So one is that Canadians are a lot more financially vulnerable than what you would actually might think. So uh, this is a TD, their financial um, health index that they released last year, but almost 50% of Canadians don't save any money from month to month, right? About a third are una unable to pay uh, all of their bills on time, and 31% are say they have more debt than they are manage than manageable. And even if we think of like coronavirus and what's happening today, um, there's different demographics that are impacted differently, right? So if you're a gig worker, um, it's a lot harder because you don't have that secure income, you don't have um, you don't have sick day benefits, it's a lot harder to actually leave your job. So how, ca how can we use tech to actually solve these challenges that people are facing? Um, what we also realized was that there's actually a lot of different organizations and startups that want to solve these problems, right? But they weren't feeling supported by the ecosystem that was here in Canada. Uh, so one story that really resonated was uh, we talked to a founder who wanted to help newcomers access credit, uh, but really, at very early on, she was talking to mentors and advisors and accelerators, and they kept on telling her, no, there's no business opportunity. You have to focus on high net worth individuals. So that's what she did. She switched. So that's what we want to prevent, right? We want to prevent people that are mission-driven, but either switching in terms of the demographic that they're serving, or a lot of people we talk about, uh, they get supported by organizations in the, United, in the U.S. or elsewhere, and they end up moving their operations there instead. Um, and so on that note, right, so there are actually a lot of initiatives similar to ours globally. And when we were looking at this, um, there's all these, um, these are all different accelerators globally that are uh, working with financial health startups or working to tackle uh, poverty uh, and low-income challenges. Um, actually, Ample Labs, um, see, you'll hear from CG in a bit, she was part of Fast Forward, uh, that accelerator. And then um, sure, uh, Just Fix, uh, who will also talk in a bit, they were part of uh, Blue Ridge Labs. So, but this type of program didn't exist in Canada um, for this specific challenge. So what we really wanted to know was just why don't we take what's working elsewhere and why don't we bring it here to Canada? Um, so that's, that was the genesis of Innovate Financial Health. Um, so this is just a bit of timeline. So um, in terms of my background, uh, Leah mentioned it. I, I was a management consultant before doing this fellowship and I had just taken a leave of absence uh, to be at Mars for the nine months, and I was planning on going back. Uh, but then we were getting a lot of good advice and a lot of good feedback from all of our advisors. Um, so decided not to do that, not to go back to consulting, um, and just try and pursue Innovate Financial Health. Uh, actually, uh, one of our advisors, uh, one of our benefits was an advisor gave us a desk space, and then he actually paid me like two days a week, and I was actually working with the Royal Society of the Arts as well um, to run a program. So that's kind of for eight months I was doing that while I was just talking to every single bank I could get in front of, every single investor, every like the government as well, uh, and just trying to raise funding. So uh, luckily enough, after about eight months, we managed to convince uh, a couple of people to give us some money. So we had J.P. Morgan Chase and Capital One get involved. Um, then for the next several months. Uh, we were just trying to design the program. So we talked to folks like CG uh, at Ample Labs and uh, kind of any financial health startup that I could get in front of to figure out what challenges they were facing in the ecosystem, uh, where they weren't getting supported, um, what was the access that they were missing uh, in order to design our program. And then now we're in the middle of our first cohort. So we're kind of two months in. Um, we're going to be wrapping up and having celebration in April. But the goal is actually to expand this so that it's an annual program every single year and really create this whole ecosystem of innovators that are focused on financial health. Um, this is uh, our partners at the moment. Uh, we have some funding from the city of Toronto as well now. Um, so have government involved. Uh, and then we have kind of all our different operating Pro, uh, program mentors. The only reason I want to mention this is because um, 
we wanted to talk about partnerships and I think it's very, very challenging because everybody has a different view of who we should be, right? So if you, I'm talking to venture capital firms, uh, they want me to select the best startups financially. If I'm talking to nonprofits, they want me to focus on the most impact focused startups, even if the business case doesn't really make sense, right? So there's a lot of different players to balance uh, when you're trying to do something like this and you're trying to satisfy all of their needs while re remaining kind of uh, reminding yourself what your mission is as well. So I want to uh, leave off with just a couple of lessons learned uh, throughout this process. Uh, I don't know how applicable this is kind of for the crowd here from the government, but I, th I think it could be useful in terms of just what I've learned throughout this process. Um, first, I think it's super important when you're trying to solve a social challenge just to understand what the problem is and what is already being done, um, especially if you're thinking from a systems change level. Um, a lot of times uh, when I tell people I'm working on financial health, uh, people, um, there's a lot of bias and assumptions and people are very solutions oriented. So a lot of people will tell me, oh, the solution is just uh, financial literacy. We just need to teach everybody good finances and then um, <laughs> good finances, sorry, my time's up, but I'll, I'll hurry up. Um, we just need to teach everyone good finances and that will solve the problem. But a lot of research shows that that's not the case, that financial literacy isn't the problem, but access to products and services. So you really need to understand who's doing what, uh, where your capacity is. Um, we weren't sure if we were going to do our own startup or policy paper or, or innovate financial health. Um, and for me, it just didn't make sense to do my startup because I don't come from a tech background, I don't come from a design background, whereas this is something that I could actually influence with the, the network that we have. Um, make sure that you're talking to your end users. We spend a lot of time just talking, in our case, to the startups to figure out what their needs are. Um, tell people what you're doing so that you actually get, because um, then people know who you are and they can support you. Uh, a lot of our program funders and mentors are all cold email. So actually Chase, uh, I just cold emailed them to tell them what I'm doing and that's, that led to funding within kind of a month, two months. So definitely ask, right? And then uh, for the last point is just think of, think of your partners and try to satisfy them, but all, always remember the bigger picture. Um, in our case, it's not even just supporting the four startups, right? It's how do I change and get um, how do I influence change in terms of improving financial health? Um, and so supporting the four startups is part of that, but you also have to remind yourself that there's a broader ecosystem that you have to support as well. And just keeping that in mind, because it's very easy with all the different players involved to kind of get sidetracked by trying to satisfy their needs. So that's it for me. Um, I have my website and email here in case you want to contact me uh, and looking forward for the rest of the conference. All right. Uh, I'm excited to bring up CG Chen next. Uh, CG Chen, CG's pronouns are she and her. Um, CG is the founder of Ample Labs, a tech nonprofit committed to using technology to empower individuals facing homelessness. She's a community leader, a uh, community builder who cares about building a more inclusive, accessible, and equitable tech sector that includes the most marginalized and vulnerable. Prior to Ample, she was at Ecobee, designing mobile experiences for IoT devices. And she's also worked at Tulip, designing enterprise software for luxury retailers like Chanel, Kate Spade, Michael Kors, and Frank and & Oak. Please join me in welcoming CG. Got it. Cool. Um, yeah, Leah, thank you for uh, inviting me up. Um, yeah, super glad to be here with you all today. Um, I like how Elvis really started off with kind of introducing the perspective. Uh, and so personally, uh, speaking on behalf of Ample, um, the perspective I come from is uh, prior to Ample being Ample, uh, you know, I was involved in the civic tech community here in the city. So we were working on the prototype of our app for about a year before I decided to quit my job and, you know, make this uh, into, uh, turn this into a company. So I guess the perspective I can provide is, you know, what does it take for someone um, who's deeply, deeply concerned about social issues, uh, you know, using technology to try to tackle and you know ultimately trying to work with government trying to partner with government um, and stuff like that so uh, yeah CG founder of Ample Labs um, 
So our mission, like Leia introduced, is um, to empower people facing homelessness using technology. Our vision is a bold one. We envision a world where nobody has to face homelessness. And I'm just going to stop right here, and I kind of want to ask the audience a couple things. So hands up for, tru uh, for truth. Uh, and then hands down for false. False. So I kind of just want to ask a couple questions. So how many people th here think majority of people experiencing homelessness are folks that we see sleeping outside on the streets? So hands up if you think that's true. Hands down if you think that's false. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, people who are sleeping outside uh, are about 20% of the homeless population. Oh, sorry. Uh, second question, how many people here think that majority of people experiencing homelessness do not have mobile phones and do not use phones? Hands up if you think they don't. Hands down if you think they do. Okay, all right, I will also speak to that. So 94% of people experiencing homelessness actually have phones. 77% have smartphones. Why am I doing this? So um, I've always been someone who has always thought about, you know, I worked in tech, I was designing apps. Um, I w I've always thought about, you know, how can I make more of an impact, right? I was doing some really cool things, you know, designing apps for luxury retailers, and I always felt like there was a part of me missing. So. Um, part of me that wanted to, to create impact. So I would come to Civic Tech, you know, I would think about um, what I could do, and homelessness was something that I was always interested in. Um, but something happened that was very personal. So about a year and a half ago, um, my friend Simon here called me one day out of the blue, and he said, hey, CG, can I crash at your place? I'm about to get evicted. Um, I just got laid off for the second time. I don't have any savings because, um, you know, I've been supporting my single mother and two sister. Can I crash at your place for a while to figure this out? And I I said, yeah, Simon, of course, but you know, while you're at it, let's try to figure out this eviction thing. And so um, because he was you know, obviously mentally overwhelmed with what was going on, um, I took on the responsibility of trying to figure out you know, what to do with, the, with an eviction. So I turned to Google. First place I knew how, and I was just trying to figure out what to do, what are the steps, and I went through, you know, about four to six hours of scrolling through websites, going, looking on government websites, trying to figure out what services are there, and the entire time I'm thinking, I mean, this is so frustrating, even for me, and if I were in Simon's shoes, how frustrating would it be knowing that I only have two weeks, I'm, I'm not about to have a place to live, and try to figure this out. So I was thinking, you know, is there a way that we can, you know, can we create something, is there something out there to make this process easier? Um, I, yeah, so, so the reason this is important is because majority of people are, um, who experience homelessness are kind of like Simon, right? So they're hidden. They may be first-time experiencers. And when we looked at um, the growth rate of people who are hidden versus people who are chronically homeless, we actually realized that in terms of, of the annual growth rate, more and more people are falling just into homelessness than people who are you know, ending up chronically homeless or in, end up on the streets. So here's the key insight. <clears throat> Why did, we, why did we propose a tech solution? Why were we thinking about tech? We learned this statistic. So 94% of people experiencing homelessness own a smartphone, 70, uh, sorry, mobile phone 77 own a smartphone. So that's really, really key. It takes, um, we spent, so even prior to building anything, we spent about six months on the ground trying to figure out how do people get help right now. What we learned was that you know, it takes anywhere between 20 minutes to 48 hours to find a critical service. So something like an overnight shelter, a free meal, crisis numbers, and things like that. So our solution was, um, you know, how can we make this experience um, anonymous? What we learned was that, you know, when people are in this situation, there's a lot of shame and guilt associated, and people may not actually want to reach out to, the, uh, to their close friends. And Simon had only reached out to me, you know, two weeks before losing his apartment, and he wanted to reach out earlier, but there was a lot of, you know, shame and guilt, and he didn't even end up telling his family until he was able to get back on his feet. So, so we decided to build Chalmers. So Chalmers is a web-based chatbot, um, you can use on any mobile phone uh, or desktop. Uh, so actually, if you guys want to check it out on your phones, you can just go to Chalmers.app. Um, essentially, it helps you find and locate critical services near you in real time. So rather than going to Google, you know, we're benching. Uh, we're benchmarking Chalmers to be 60 times faster than finding a service on Google. It will um, ask for your location. It will provide you something that's happening right now in real time. And eventually, because it's uh, because we're um, using natural language processing, it can understand very complex questions. For instance, Chalmers, I'm about to get evicted. What do I do? Right? Chalmers will ask you a couple questions, understand your situation, and then say, hey, you know what? There's a free legal clinic in your community, uh, in your neighborhood. There's the housing and tenant board that you can go to for help and things like that. 
Um, so Chalmers has been live in the city of Toronto for about a year. So to date, uh, so these are Toronto stats. We've had over 10,000 unique users. Chalmers has had over 15,000 sessions. Um, and 27% of users self-identify as individuals experiencing homelessness. 77% are uh, ver very likely or likely to recommend Chalmers to a friend. Uh, we're also live in the city of Barrie, and Chalmers will be live in uh, the Niagara region in, in May. Um, yeah, and so this is, this is lessons that I've learned along the way in, in building Chalmers. Um, work with existing partners in the space. I really love what Elvis said about, you know, uh, before jumping to the solution, and I, I like to do that, really looking at um, the ecosystem and understanding who is there. So in the beginning, we actually didn't do that. I'm going to be completely honest. We said, you know, let's build this thing, and okay, well, we definitely need data, so let's just, you know, scrub, um, scrub the city's website, put it in Excel, call that a database, and maintain it ourselves. Easy, done. We did that, and for a month, it was impossible to maintain, right? And I was working with volunteers, so what we would do is we would do monthly data thons at the end of the month we'd pull up that database call every single service uh, service on there to validate if their you know times are true and things like that and that was just completely not scalable so we couldn't we couldn't sustain that and then what we realized well there's this great um, charity out there called 211 Ontario and they actually house 200,000 services they've got about 20 full-time staff and that's their job right it's their mandate to house these services keep it up to date and things like that so we started to use uh, we started to work with them and now it's really simple you know we um, we plug in we call their API uh, you know we um, sanitize the data a little bit, plug it into Chalmers, and what's really cool about um, uh, working with us is that um, accurate accuracy of information is so important because as we've learned, you know, when people, uh, if, if you're going to recommend services to people and there's anything that is wrong within your data, you, people lose trust very easily, people so, will stop using you. So we've actually been able to create a closed loop here. So for um, service providers, especially social workers who have a really intimate understanding of the services, times and things like that, if they notice anything that's inaccurate within Chalmers, they can just give us feedback right there. This gets sent directly to 211 Ontario within 48 hours, that information is going to be updated. So not only, you know, do we learn, okay, work with existing partners but how can you sort of better uh, each other and so here's an example of how um, so buy-in from cities um, you know Toronto Toronto's a big city three million people and you know government um, just as big right and so when we were um, when we were starting out we're like you know let's 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 talk to the city let's tell them what we're doing uh, you know let's try to see if we can get funding get them to work with us blah 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 we tried and we tried and we tried we knocked on doors we tried to set up meetings and I would say majority of people are kind of what's on the left here they weren't really interested. Um, you know, they were skeptical. It's a chat bot. You know, what are you going to do with data? Do you want to automate and replace social workers? We're, we're just not really interested. So we didn't get very far. So, but, but you know what? We said, let's just launch it anyways, put it out there, and see what people think, right? Again, it really mattered to us if, at the end of the day, if people were going to use it and if people found value. And again, loving what Alva said about listening to end users. And then with the city of Barrie, um, they're what I would call on the, uh, on the right. So when we launched in Toronto, we got an email from the mayor's office in the city of Barrie. They said, hey, love what you guys are doing um, with Chalmers in Toronto. Do you want to bring it here? And we were like, yeah, sure, why not? So within about, uh, I think, like four weeks, we closed the deal. We started, um, we, we were building to, to pilot. And so we were able to run a pilot with the city of Barrie last year from September to the end of December. Um, and I think this is this is really important. So the reason they're champions is because you know they know that reactive government is very expensive. Homelessness is a big problem there, big in many regions. But they said, hey, you know, we're interested in adopting this technology because we want to be more proactive. Um, I'm kind of going to skip this because I'm just looking at time. So wh what happened um, after the four-month pilot? So they were really bought in, and because they were champions, they said, hey, you know, leave it to us. Once this app is up and running in our city, it'll be our job to get it out there. We're going to get it out there to as many people as we can. So what they ended up doing was they worked with the hospitals, they worked with police officers, uh, colleges, and Chalmers essentially spread around the whole city. So after the four-month pilot, we had 197 police officers using Chalmers on their phone and in their cars to make referrals, right? Again, people come up to a police officer, I think you know where services are. They don't. They actually turn to Google, but now they can turn to Chalmers. Uh, we had 20 community organizations end up um, becoming part of the pilot. So now it's on every single computer in the Barry uh, library. And not only that, Barry wants to renew Chalmers for the next three years. And so, you know, we got 
quotes from the mayor's office, Sergeant Angela out there, um, Salvation Army. Everybody was really excited. Everybody um, saw impact. So really quickly, I know I'm kind of out of time. Um, get champions on your side. I mean, for us, we got really lucky. Our champion came to us. But, you know, we also learned that if we want to move quickly, let's work with people who are ready, you know, kind of like, you know, push, push, push what moves, oh, sorry. Um, collaborate uh, with people who's already the, doing the work, right? So City of Barry, they've already begun thinking about, you know, how can we move towards a more digital government? How can we bo be more proactive in all of the other things that we're doing? So we're already there. Bring the community and experts onto your team. Um, yeah, I mean, so again, in the beginning, we were kind of, um, with the whole, you know, trying to maintain a database, doing it ourselves, you know, speaking to 211. But in terms of the experts, I think, you know, we have a really, really vibrant tech sector. So we were able to bring on real, like, chatbot experts, engineers from TD, from some of the startups. They got involved, and it was really, really easy to sort of build technology when you have experts on your team. Have this thick skin and don't give up. I mean, I think I've emailed the city. I, I, I've lost count. I've lost, <laughs> I've lost count of the number of times that I've tried to set up meetings. Um, so, but you know, we're, we're not giving up. Um, and have fun. I mean, um, 10 minutes, there's not a lot to, to talk about, you know, some of the personal challenges that come up, but I can tell you this week, I had a friend reach out and say, hey, CG, um, I have a student who's about to lose uh, her place. She's terrified of shelters. She doesn't know what to do. Can you help, right? And when you get an, uh, when, when I get an email like that, I kind of have to drop everything and say, hey, I'm willing to get in touch with her, I'm willing to chat with her, and things like that, right? And so, you know, for folks that work on the front lines, this is their day-to-day, -day, and so I can understand why people burn out, but the importance of having fun is, um, you know, so that you can do this for a long time, right? Because this is heavy stuff. Um, our website, my email, if you have questions. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Uh, wow. Um, uh, thank you, CG. Um, uh, lastly, I want to introduce um, George Clement. Um, George, as I mentioned, was unable to travel because of the uh, new, new restrictions that, that came in. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about him. And he has a, we have a video that we'll share of his, um, of his sharing some of his work. Um, so George is the co-founder and executive director of JustFix.NYC, which is a nonprofit that builds data-driven tools for tenants and organizers facing displacement. Uh, he's also a Cheng Fellow and a Kennedy Fellow studying the intersection of technology and public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And previously, George was a, fa a fellow and a blue, uh, fellow with Blue Ridge Labs. Why is that so hard to say? At the Robin Hood Foundation and a product manager with General Assembly. He's been selected as a Forbes 30 under 30 in law and policy and American Express emerging innovator. Um, and I'm really uh, pleased to share some of his work with you here. Here's where I hope that this works properly. Let's see. Hi, this is George Clemens. Yes. I'm one of the co-founders of Just Fix NYC. I'm really sad that I can't be there with all of you uh, in Toronto. Uh, but hopefully this is sort of the, the next best alternative. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, our journey at JustFix, the products that we currently offer, where we started, where we're at now, uh, over the next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so our mission is um, to build data-driven tools to help tenants and advocates fight displacement. We're based in New York City, as our, our name suggests, and uh, we're actually a nonprofit organization. So uh, we started as a group of co-founders that met in a fellowship program run by a large foundation in New York City, a program called Blue Ridge Labs. And we followed a lot of co-design principles, uh, community-led development over the years in um, trying to build effective technology and data projects uh, in the tenants' rights space. So the context that we came into and that we, we continue to work in uh, is one that is most known for uh, New York City's deep housing unaffordability. So you have about 42% of New Yorkers that are rent burdened, meaning uh, they are uh, paying 30% or more of their income towards rent, and about a quarter that are severely rent burdened, paying 50% or more of their income on rent. But this doesn't actually translate to high quality housing. So 20% of New York City renters 
live in housing that the city itself defines as deficient housing, with three or more serious maintenance code violations present and unaddressed at any given time. Now these are issues like rat and cockroach infestations, lack of heat, mold, things that have really serious health implications uh, for the families and especially the children living in these homes. So there's lots of situations of tenants who are paying 50% or more of their rent, of their income on rent, and still living in homes with these kinds of conditions. This is worsened by the fact that the ultimate step in resolving these issues is to take these issues to housing court. But housing court is a context where historically over 90% of tenants have lacked any kind of legal representation. And on the other side of the courtroom, over 90% of lawyers are represented, over 90% of landlords are represented by lawyers. So it's this really severely imbalanced context that tenants are trying to um, use to get resolutions. So you can imagine it results in a lot of tenants that struggle uh, to enforce the laws in the way that they deserve. So when we look at this problem altogether, uh, New York City is looking at almost a million tenants being displaced from their homes in the coming years. So we started working um, really closely with tenants, lawyers, uh, community organizers, judges in housing court, and a number of other stakeholders involved in the housing justice ecosystem. And it was very, very important for us to center the tenants and the advocates that have been doing work in this space or experiencing these issues firsthand for decades that they should really be driving the development of the tools that we're building. So we are simply adding another tool to the toolkit of the tenants' rights movement rather than trying to replace any uh, existing in-person resources or anything like that, but really trying to build the capacity of the tenants' rights movement that exists. So when we looked at this from a tenant's perspective, tenants are looking at an unbelievably overwhelming and complex web of resources that are available to them to try to um, navigate some kind of resolution. One of those aspects was in the housing court, we saw a number of tenants that would actually, in trying to explain the issues that they were dealing with in their apartment, they would actually take out their smartphones and show the judge pictures that they'd taken on their phone. Now there's about 80% of low-income New Yorkers that have some kind of Wi-Fi enabled phone, and obviously the majority of those phones have some sort of photo capabilities. There are a lot of tenants that were documenting their situations in this informal way, and just struggling to present it in an organized and formal way for um, judges to be able to actually uh, take this into evidence for use in their case. So over the past uh, three and a half years, we have built a number of digital services that are uh, connected and um, have created sort of a one-stop shop uh, for tenants who are dealing with a variety of issues um, in New York. So we'll start with some of these precursors to actually go into court. So the first is sending a letter of complaint to your landlord. So this is a step that any lawyer would recommend a tenant uh, take before actually going to housing court. Uh, and we help tenants um, to complete uh, a letter template very, very quickly and easily, and then we take care of mailing it via certified mail directly to their landlord. They can also request what's called their rent history document from the state agency that tells them what their, um, uh, their rent should be on a monthly basis. And finally, they can also create the court filings themselves to bring a case in housing court. Now, we help tenants to do this in a very step-by-step -step way, uh, auto-filling fields when we can get um, information from open data, and uh, making the language as straightforward as possible, uh, and automating as many steps in the process as we can. Uh, the last piece also is for tenants who are dealing with an active eviction case. We operate an eligibility screener uh, called Eviction 3 NYC to help tenants understand if they're eligible for a free attorney or not. Um, New York City and numerous cities around the country are just uh, passing legislation and implementing policies that are guaranteeing legal representation for low-income tenants 
facing eviction in housing court. Uh, so we're working with a number of those cities to roll out similar um, types of programs, uh, hopefully in the coming uh, months. And we've served over 20,000 tenants in the last two years, helping them to resolve a number of different issues. So about a year and a half ago, um, we started observing some trends in the tenants that we were working with, right? And we couldn't have stopped at simply um, sort of making this bureaucratic process uh, of filing these types of complaints a little bit easier. But we wanted to actually dig into these stories and understand some of the trends that we were seeing. So we identified a few tenants that were living in different parts of the city, but we noticed that they actually lived in buildings that were owned or managed by the same companies. And so we started looking at some of the open data that we could get uh, from city agencies and looked at our data from the cases that we had processed and started to connect the dots to understand how many of these buildings were actually owned by the same companies. And we identified that this is a situation of a, a bit of an 80-20 type of problem where only 20% of the companies or the landlords were resulting in 80% of the issues. So it's really critical to identify who are the worst perpetrators who are operating business models um, that are premised on uh, evicting tenants from their homes and um, having their buildings um, fall into really poor conditions. So we built a tool called Who Owns What? That's a one-stop shop for um, tenants and advocates to research uh, individual buildings and also entire portfolios of buildings across the city owned or managed by the same companies. So this data is now used across a variety of different contexts, including um, lawyers using this in group litigation, um, tenant organizers using this for larger organizing campaigns across entire portfolios, journalists using it for media investigations, and finally, um, people in the city itself that are using this to do better due diligence when landlords or management companies are applying for permits or applying for financing for new projects. So we had over 100,000 unique users across all of these just fixed services in 2019 and are continuing to scale up this year. And this is really our theory of change. How can we provide these really effective um, digital services on an individual basis, but not stop there? And actually think about how can, as we look at that data in aggregate, also start to um, use that to propel um, system level change and policy level change. And a big piece of that is making sure that we are uh, closely integrated with the organizing movements in this space and not simply thinking of ourselves as a civic tech organization um, isolated or only working through government processes. But we are part of um, a movement that has been working for decades and decades to improve um, the conditions and the circumstances for tenants um, and a movement that is primarily led by tenants. And so we really work in service of that movement. So we've had a lot of success, have started really scaling up um, in the past couple of years in New York. And now we are looking to um, start to understand how we can um, replicate some of these services uh, in service of tenant movements uh, that are uh, building in other cities around the country. So we're first starting with um, working with a really uh, fantastic partner in Los Angeles uh, called SAGE, Strategic Actions for a Just Economy. And they are um, a group that's been working uh, primarily in South Central LA uh, for decades. And uh, we are um, helping to understand, uh, or hoping to understand um, how we can best uh, be in service um, of uh, the needs of tenants in Los Angeles. So that is likely starting with um, helping them with implementation of right to counsel and uh, making sure that uh, tenants are getting the information they need um, when they need it. 
uh, as they try to uh, fight evictions and uh, enforce um, enforce their rights around uh, better code enforcement and maintenance violations. And we do that through a process of co-design, working closely with the organizers and the tenants on the ground. So uh, please reach out to me if you have any other questions. Um, my contact information is there. Uh, you can go to justfix.nyc to learn even more. Uh, again, very sorry I can't be with you all in person. Um, but uh, very excited about the work uh, that you all are doing. So thanks so much.